Well, Labor did pledge before the election it would allow people that were here on temporary protection visas to resettle permanently in Australia as long as they'd come before the deadline. That was 2013. It was first announced by Kevin Rudd back when he was Prime Minister. Joining me now, the Australian Financial Review's political editor, Philip Curry. It's a move that Labor's long flagged. It's, mm. It would do it, now it's done it. So what's the, the significance of this in your view? Oh, I think, Tom, it just rekindles memories of um, when Labor last got into government and one of the first things they did was abolish the Pacific solution. And we know that had sort of catastrophic consequences both on a human aspect and, a, and politically. I don't, this isn't on par with that and this mm. has been promised. Um, but no, no doubt, you know, it, it, well, we've seen already on your show this morning and others, the Coalition's been pretty quick to get in there and, and try and sort of raise the same spectre that I heard Karen Andrews, the Shadow Home Affairs Minister, today warning of an armada, you know, <laughs> the potential for an armada of boats to come again. Yeah. So, so it just sort of rewakens all that. It's sort of a bit of coincidence. We had Kevin Rudd in the building today talking, giving the 15th anniversary of his apology. It was his... It was his it's very diplomatic now and wouldn't really offer a comment. No, no, no. I, <laughs> so, I guess, so on the flip side to that, mm, with all these warnings, mm, if nothing much mm, happens, or if there's a couple mm, of votes and they're turned back and that mm, proves to be the true deterrent, Labor can say... We didn't, yeah. There's no yeah, problem. And, it's, new, it's a, you know, yeah. bipartisan policy now, realistically. Yeah. And, look, the timing of it, Tom, they've timed this with the monsoon season, so even if someone wanted to have a, have a try now, you wouldn't. Uh, and I, I suspect, you know, that the, the border force and the Navy and everyone else has been put on super high alert to be extra vigilant over the next few days and weeks because no doubt someone will make an, make, make an attempt. So, you know, they're, they're not... They're, they're much more mindful now of the, of, the, of the potential consequences of doing something like this than they, they were very, very, very blasé about it back in uh, 2008. A lot of focus on the RBA and Philip Lowe. He mm. hasn't done his usual public engagement. Mm. And so as a result, there was a lot of focus. He had a private briefing mm. with some investment bankers. I mean, the explosive stuff initially out of this was that he allegedly said something along the lines that we'd need rate hikes in line with the US mm. cash rate, which mm. is poking towards five. And then there was a sort of background clarification. No, 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 that's not the case. Yeah. But it shows the danger of only doing that private briefing. Well, Chinese whispers, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. I was surprised he did. Oh, look, maybe he's feeling a bit wounded at the moment that um, he, he didn't feel the need to do a press conference or do something later in the week. Uh, but, you know, that's probably the old, the, old, the old way they used to do it. But, um, you know, politically now, I mean, interest rates is just... You know, I was sort of saying this yesterday. It's just become... We haven't sort of seen this since the Howard years when people argued over interest rates and I think the addition to it this time, Tom, is there's a loss, loss of confidence in the Reserve Bank and its judgement uh, because of that poor guidance that was given oh, and how long we'd be at that sort of almost zero interest rate. Mm. So that's why it's, this whole thing has got an extra edge to it now. With the government just begging inflation and all the indicators mm. there to go down so the hikes yeah. don't have to be too extreme. And, yeah, and, oh, look. And, and we, we're out of the hiking phase sooner rather than later. That's like that, that's the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and right? I mean, if you look at it from the government's perspective, you know, better now than at the end of the term. So they'll, yeah. go, they'll go towards the next election with interest rates coming down again. it's not that... Crash landing. No, especially if the RBA overcooks it and puts us into recession, then, you know, by Christmas they'll be dropping them again. So. Jim Chalmers has indicated no budget surpluses over the four mm. years, which the hope for this, I mean, if, you know, a few months ago mm. he would have said, well, so what? Of course there yeah. wouldn't be. But the hope was the, the rivers of gold were flowing so much yeah. through mining and so on yeah. that maybe we might be able to look, balance this. But look, I guess it shows the cost pressures that are there. Look, yeah, it does. I mean, there was a massive consolidation of the budget over the last couple of years, over $150 billion, you know, the, the budget bounced back. And so people were thinking, well, if this continues, we could almost hit a balance this year you know, and a surplus next year. Um, and what the Treasurer seems to be saying now, that when he says not, not only will there not be a surplus this year, but not for the next three afterwards, is that the revenue bounce back is probably going to slow, but also the, the amount of spending on the books is just crazy, you know, defence and the NDIS... Uh, and the interest pressure payments. on health, yeah, and interest payments on debt. So mm. um, they've got to, they've got to start really doing something about that. Especially, especially NDIS. You know the things they can do something about. Uh, it can't just be one way. You can't just be sort of cutting spending or sorry, sorry, increasing revenue and, and cutting, in, you know, increasing taxes and stuff if you're not going to make an effort to cut spending because. It's sort of, you know, as Chalmers has been saying, since it became Treasurer, we'll get close and then it'll open up again and they've got to minimise that opening up. And, that, and the key to that is that will all feed into timing for the next election because yeah. by that point, mm. the next set of forward estimates, there'll be pressure to say, 
are we getting towards, you know, balanced at least? Are we on that pathway? They would, probably, they would love to say that, no doubt. Yeah. You know, they're, they're back back in surplus by the next election or forecast, but we've seen that before. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, this, this brings the state's three tax cuts back into sharp focus, you know, the, the, the calls to abolish those. How live is that debate, do you think? I don't think it's very live at the moment, but it, it will be, or will be very live, um, probably on the other side of this budget. Uh, you know, people will be demanding they, they be reined in so the money be used for other stuff. Because middle of next year is when it kicks in, so it's getting... I think the government's got till next budget in May to make a decision on that. They don't have to rush. You want to, you know, again, we could be in recession by next year and yeah. and they may be quite handy, so uh, we'll just... But I, I wouldn't be making a decision. But people are going to start right. making demands for sure. Phil Curry, thank you. Welcome.